So I'm going to jump into the fertilizer and, and, and fertility theory, but this is what I want to talk about next, which is a Korean natural farming procedure called indigenous microorganisms, IMO. And what this is, is culturing your uh, local native forest microbiology, well forest in our case, uh, and enhancing that native microbiology into an extremely uh, vigorous state, and then reintroducing it into your field. It, the, the reason for that is essentially that our agricultural techniques, we've cleared the forest, removed the native biology, tillage and open culture, you know, we've just creamed any kind of biology that was, would have been initially in place and really simplified it and brought it into basically a rundown biological condition. And so a very effective uh, means of that, which has become very popular worldwide, is the idea to culture your native microbiology and reintroduce it into your field. So what that looks like is to, in this case, these uh, procedures are in Master Cho's manuals here, but uh, as I was saying, they're pretty popular and I'm sure that they're on the internet and things like that. But what I'm gonna describe the process to you here which is what you do is you take a box, uh, cedar boxes preferred, you can make a, I've used pine boxes, other people use wicker baskets, and you half fill it with partially cooked grain. In Korea they use rice, we've used rice, we've used different materials, uh, and pretty much any grain seems to work just fine. So you partially cook, essentially like half cook the grain, the rice, which for us, you know, you know, if rice is usually two water to one part rice, we lower the water content to one part water, one part rice, and cook it for half as long as you normally would. So like 20 minutes or 30 minutes or something like that. So you end up with a partially hydrated, partially cooked grain substrate. So you obviously you've sterilized the grain essentially. And then you put it into this box, which actually is not sterilized, but the cedar is uh, antimicrobial essentially and you set the box into the forest leaf litter. So, and that looks like sh shuffing aside the leaf litter, getting down into the duff, and you stuff the box down into the duff as much as you can relatively easily, and then you heap the forest uh, residues back on top of the box, which has a lid on the top of it which sheds excessive rain, if there's an excessive rain event or anything like that. Yes, you can throw some of the duff inside the box too if you want, but uh, it doesn't really matter, it cultures either way. Does it matter how big the wooden box is that we're starting with? Not really, uh, the box that we use, you know, it's gonna be half full of rice. And the fir first culture, I told you how just a couple handfuls cover, you know, four or 500 pounds of bran. So you really don't need a lot, but however, Rice is not very expensive, so making more is probably uh, of benefit too. We take, I believe it's half a gallon of rice into a box that is, I, I believe it's like probably nine inches by maybe 16 and maybe four inches tall. So it just as a rough idea and it's got a lid on it to keep, you know, because excessive rain on it can be a problem in the forest. And so this partially cooked rice then readily within about a week's time, longer in very cool temperatures, a little shorter during the summertime, in about a week's time is covered with a white fungal growth, basically resembling that right there. So you've got a box of white fungal growth. You might get a few little off color uh, growth of different funguses. It's not a big deal as long as it's primarily the white fungal growth that you're looking at, say 70, 80%. So, and now in terms of locating the culture area, so you, you, you can go out into the forest and essentially the Koreans recommend culturing under deciduous trees, 
we do do that, and the Koreans are not real particular. They say a barren area can work well, or a lusher area. Uh, often a little bit higher in elevation might be a little bit better than your present condition. But uh, we primarily use our senses when we're in the forest to determine the proper area to set the box, which is to say, you know, you're looking for a large deciduous tree area, something relatively vibrant, uh, potentially older. But uh, the smell of the forest is another re real big giveaway because this whole culture process is very odiferous. And as you do this, you will identify certain forest microbiology smells. So, but smelling the, so the forest, the soils in the forest, and you know, you really, uh, you attune your senses to some of the proper smells you might be looking for. And any other means of determining the proper site, you know, there's always uh, the guidance of natural systems. You know, look for whatever other factors may guide you to the proper location. So you take that box of rice back to your farm and you then culture it into an organic brown sugar at a one-to-one -one ratio. I believe that's by weight. And I think this is all probably in the handout, all these, the actual ratios and things. So, and so you have the, now got your rice culture in a crock with sugar. And of course, that cultures the sugar, gets a little cranked up, uh, feeds the sugars to the microbes, and you start getting these uh, pretty powerful smells start to occur off of it. Very, not bad smells, kind of pleasant smells, but pretty odiferous. And then, uh, so it starts to look kind of like a, a rice gruel kind of material. That stage, after about a week's growth, uh, we grow it in the root cellar, a little bit of air, a uh, piece of butcher's paper on the top, with a little bit of holes poked into it so insects can't get in, but air can penetrate a little bit. And that culture at that stage is relatively stable in the root cellar during the summer. So as we start culturing over the course of the year, maybe we'll go out to the forest three or four times, and we'll have then in the root cellar three or four cultures at that stage that can be used to inoculate the next stage, which is a pile of bran. In Korea, they use rice bran, which is the byproduct of white rice, and it's basically free. There is just tremendous volumes of rice bran. In America, organic bran, which is what I like to use, is unfortunately a great ingredient in the organic feed industry. So there is no excess of bran in America that I'm aware of. So we have to purchase actual bran, either from our local food cooperative or from, well, actually, we have a, a grain grower in our region that does a sifted flour that he is kind enough to bring us uh, maybe several hundred pounds of bran a year. So, you know, the bran, is much more expensive here than in Korea. In Korea, this process is essentially not very expensive. So our total brand expense, since we culture a lot of this over the course of a year, is probably approaching $1,000. And so we cut the brand with coconut coir, which we have for the potting soil formula. So the coconut coir is good medium for fungal species, and it kind of dilutes out the uh, bran expense. It's less expensive than bran. And so we mix coconut coir in, probably not 50%, maybe like 30 or 40% coconut coir to bran. And then you, you take that pile and you, you, uh, you apply the liquidized second culture, IMO number two it's called, at about maybe a 1 to 500 ratio with the water and you sprinkle it all around into the pile of bran. So to do a pile about this size, maybe we took 
a couple handfuls of that IMO2 culture, mix it into water, stir it around, and then apply the liquid into the area. The pile is often covered with either grain bags from the bran or leaf, or we have now switched to covering it with hoops and a black plastic tarp. The temperature, so the pile of bran is only about six inches in height because we're seeking to keep the temperature down at about 120 degrees or below, which is beneficial for fungal activity. If you start getting much higher than that, you start getting too much bacteria and other microbes that aren't necessarily the ones that you wanted to be culturing. And you can have a die out. So we try to keep the temperature uh, lower to keep the fungal organisms happy. And we do that by keeping that pile thin. Sometimes the stuff really wants to heat. We'll get down to two, three inches thick in order to keep it from going above 120 degrees. That's how biologically active the material is. You know, two inches of this bran mixture wants to heat to 150 degrees. And that's not because of the bran, that's because of this tremendous biological activity that happens uh, with this culturing system. So, you know, you're constantly working to keep the temperature down for, it takes about a week to get up to this kind of a culture right here. And there's tremendous smells coming off the pile as this is occurring. You know, you want the smells to be relatively pleasing. Sometimes it smells like bread. There might be some yeasts in there and things like that. But uh, you get these forest-like smells. Sometimes you can get some off smells. That's usually because it got too wet somehow. You want the moisture, it's said at like 50 to 60% moisture content, which is essentially if you take a pile of the pran and squeeze it, you can barely get a drop of water out of it. And it, we usually water it once over the course of that week in order to keep that level of moisture up because those microbes consume water really quickly and the pile can dry out. So we do maintain a little bit, a little bit of the moisture with water, but essentially it takes about a week to get to this stage. So there it is culturing up. And like I said, this is one of my favorite pictures. It's showing how frothy and just, just vigorous the uh, pile can become. There's another picture. So this might be later. So after that third week, it is. So after that third week, you've got this, the, the fungal organisms, the white growth might start to be collapsing and stuff as the food and whatnot is, is utilized. But as soon as a week goes by and you see any kind of movement towards collapse or full growth, it's time, or lowering temperature, it's time to mix in soil. So that's the fourth stage, is to take an equal amount of soil and mix it with the third stage by volume. And so you end up with what looks like, it looks like a really fungal rich compost material because it has some soil in it, has this decomposed bran and all these fungal organisms. And so it kind of resembles really fungally rich soil. And you know the soil helps keep the temperature down, but you, you still want to maintain temperature, make sure it's not going above uh, 120 degrees. And I believe that the microorganisms are really good, at least the ones I'm culturing, are really good at fixing atmospheric nitrogen because these piles can stay phenomenally warm and you can get nitrogen smells out of the pile for a long time and they're really, you know, bran does not really contain that much nitrogen and you know soil you know sugar i mean a little bit in the rice but how much you know you put two handfuls of rice you know it's mostly all carbon materials yet there is phenomenal amounts of nitrogen uh present to keep up those temperatures and keep that smell so really active biology that you're working with here so where are we laying this material so the location to do this procedure is under deciduous trees. 
where you're getting some light, but not full sun. So it's like dappled shade scenario is the perfect location. The area should be well drained so that you don't build up too much water in the area. So a well drained dappled shade area. And it is useful to culture the same area again and again. So you can keep doing it on the same area as you remove the piles off, put a new pile on, and we actually go in kind of a rotation in that area. Yeah, once you get to the fourth stage with the soil mixed into it, it's pretty stable too. And so I have a pile right now that's under a hoop tunnel cover under the snow, and it's gonna be used first thing in the spring, and then I'll come back in and start making new piles as the season moves along. And so it's kind of like a constant production. We don't put it down before every single crop, but essentially uh, the, the couple acres plus, they get some of it at some point during the year. And that volume looks like a five gallon bucket to probably maybe 250 square feet plus or minus, you know, we'll put down more if we've made more, less if we've made less. And we like to lay it down in chunks as opposed to breaking it up more because uh, the chunks have a better survival rate of the fungal organisms and tend to shoot off. You can see, you know, the, the fungal organisms growing into that compost and mulch, as I said. So you can you see that the, the, the chunks actually give you a little bit better growth and things like that. So we do go with a chunkier form. And as I said, you know, we take very good care of that with uh, immediately mulching it over and, and watering it in. Uh, the Koreans generally don't recommend applying it in full sun, either morning or evening. However, it seems like it works fine as long as you apply it and then mulch it within, you know, 15, 20, half hour or something get the mulch on top of the culture and then water it in after that. Water can come on later as long as you get the mulch over the top of it and get it protected. Are dogs or other animals attracted to the pile? Yes, unbelievable uh, attractive to livestock and animals. We have to have a fence around that pile to keep the poultry out. Uh, also any dogs or anything like that. Animals love to eat this stuff. It's a uh, you know, very good sign. The, well, I was at a lecture with Aaron Englander. From, he's from Maine, and he's been going around talking a lot about Korean natural farming. Uh, and we were, I was at a talk with him in Massachusetts, and we were standing over the culture pile. And he literally said, and you got to watch out because animals like to really eat this stuff. The family dog walked right up to the pile at that time and just started chowing down on these chunks of IMO. No small degree was just eating, you know, a lot of the chunks of the material. And uh, so it is very attractive to animals, which is a very good sign. And it is utilized, let me get into the utilizations of it now. So it is a very uh, versatile microbial inoculant you know, to be utilized under a number of different areas, one of which is in livestock water. And so it's uh, commonly utilized in the, the water of livestock. Obviously, you could put it into the dry feeds too. Uh, somehow, I'm, I've never experimented with that. Uh, and also, it is utilized in Korea in the bedding in the livestock facilities because it is so vigorous and animals like to eat it, and it proliferates on the bedding and reduces odors tremendously, which we have used it for in uh, where chicken manure is piled up and whatnot. And it is true that it, it, it just can consume ammonia from uh, off-gassing livestock bedding areas tremendously effectively. So it's very useful for both of those uh, systems. Then but in terms of vegetable production, where we put it down, I said we lay it down you know, before mulching, and it actively incorporates into the field. But we also can uh, we vigorously stir the material and you know, knock the microbes into water, get some air into the water, and then strain it through a fine strainer 
and we will put it into the foliar recipe. So they can go out onto leaf surfaces uh, combined with some other preparations, which I'll talk about in a minute. And of course, the same is true of you can run it through the fertigation system. So you could run it through uh, a, a liquid fertilizer system or just plain by itself. So you can feed it through the irrigation system. You can foliar feed it. You can side dress it. You can pre-plant fertilizer. Uh, so very, very versatile. You can apply it into piles of mulch and, and allow it to try to proliferate into mulch piles. You can add it to, sometimes it's added to more or less finished compost to inoculate into finished compost. And where we also utilize it with very good success is in the potting soil recipe. Okay, so let's move on now to a discussion of fertilizer, other fertilizer materials, which is to get to the point where it is how we conceive of the plant growth on this kind of, kind of balance between, as I was stating earlier, lush growth, and, which is weak and watery, and over-constricted, stunted growth. And those are, you know, two ends of a spectrum that they inter, interlap. So I see them as essentially oppositional forces. You know, the force of expansion and the force of constriction, uh, you know, and the, the oppositional forces that are so often seen in the world. So in terms of crop production, we view one direction or the other. And how you work with your soils really determines which way the crop is going to go. So an overly lush soil is uh, pushed by things like water and nitrogen and potassium, just for starters. So what that looks like is very quick growth that is watery, lower sugar content, not well pigmented, very fast growth, and lacks in things like fruiting. So you're going to delay fruiting or flowering, and you're going you're gonna to delay root growth, and you're going to have much larger top growth, and large leaves that damage relatively easily. So those are all factors of what a lush crop looks like and taken to excess. Now, what happens with lush crops, the classic, is fungal diseases because it's too lush and it's weak. So all of a sudden, uh, microbes are going to start attacking and digesting that excessively lush, unbalanced material. So very common in vegetable production is a push towards over lush growth, which becomes weak to fungal diseases. And that is because we are rewarded for size and volume in the marketplace. And because of that economic scenario, there is a big tendency to push the crop with fertilizer to get sizing. Uh, the crop will size large and it will size fast under that scenario. However, it's weak. And so the classic scenario is for farmers to push the crop to an over lush state to get their sizing and then have to defend the crop with pesticides. So it's, it's a very, very common scenario. And as I said, with fer nitrogen fertilizer manufacturing being very cheap, it's very, very easy to do. So, uh, you know, the food is low quality. 
you'll see it in the marketplace as, you know, the marketplace is full of watery fruits that taste terrible, that rot immediately when you bring them home. And that's what that is. And so on the other side is stunted growth and overconstriction. And what that looks like is pretty obvious. You don't get enough sizing to the crop and you know you didn't have enough nitrogen and you know there's going to be bitter off tastes and poor flavoring you can get you know some bright pigmentation but it, it is obviously stunted oh and then the other thing is of course premature flowering so you know farmers generally stay away from that scenario because obviously it's not economically rewarding and they come in with enough nitrogen fertilizer and potassiums and calciums and water and they keep the thing moving to the lush side. So other factors play into that whole scenario. So, and they are things like we were discussing earlier, the, the valley condition itself. So versus the hilltop or condition or the, or the field on the top of the, of the hills. The, the valley location is obviously more moisture rich, but it's also shadier, less airflow, and all of that pushes towards that lush growth. The hilltop farm is uh, open to the air, more sun, and pushes the other way towards a stunted lower growth. So you know, it's not just fertilizers, it's really the whole environment. And taking the whole environment into consideration in the fertilizer program is very useful to, to dial that in. So obviously in our valley location, we're constantly trying to constrict growth. And that's why the compost piles are so carbon rich. They're rich in silica, they're rich in magnesium, they're rich in sulfur, they're rich in phosphorus, and all those things are the ones that get you flowering and constricted growth. So, uh, you know, I'll go over them again in terms of the elements. So basically, you know, most crops you want to be right in the middle, but uh, let's talk just carbon and nitrogen for starters because it's really easy to point to that and it, and it has a big impact on this. Your nitrogen is going to push towards lush growth your carbon is going to pull that back and pull towards constricted growth. So if you come in with a lot of sawdust and lay it right down on the soil and you constrict your nitrogen down, you're going to get a small plant. It's going to, have, uh, it's going to be able to flower earlier, form a, a root earlier, like we've grown radishes like that, where we really constrict it. And you get a nice small little top. You know, obviously you can't go too far. And you get the radish to size up nice and early. So, you know, you can definitely... And that's what it's all about, is moving the, the, which way you want to move it and how much you want to move it in concert with all the environmental factors that are going on. But the nitrogen to carbon ratio of what's going on in the field is a very easy condition to point to that is weighing these two sides. And then on top of that, there, the other elements that I will point to on the side of leaf growth and lushness are things like potassium, uh, calcium, nitrogen, and potassium in a big way are the really easy ones to get an over lush growth, but calcium also causes sizing. But it is very difficult to get enough calcium into our crops actually in the Northeast. But just so you know, calcium is going to cause sizing as well. Now, constricting growth on this side, you have the classics of obviously everybody talks about phosphorus is, you know, your flowering element. And you can push flowering earlier with higher phosphorus materials. However, also over there is sulfur. And also in a very effective uh, fertilizer material to, to induce flowering is magnesium. So an Epsom salt spray or side dress of Epsom salt is a very effective means to get flowering earlier. Uh, magnesium sulfate in the case of Epsom salts. So it's the, the double combo. Uh, and also silica is over there. So 
in terms of biodynamics, they always line up. And biodynamics is good at describing this uh, duality between the two. They would discuss it as lime, which is your calcium, and silica, the forces of lime and silica. And so they, there's a lot of information about this. But all of those materials that I pointed out, if you come in to a common vegetable field and run a tissue analysis on the leaf, you are going to see low phosphorus, low magnesium, low sulfur in the crop. And generally, they don't test for silica. And you're going to see plenty of nitrogen and potassium. So you will see those things in a tissue analysis very, very frequently. So our job is to be able to guide using the fertilizer materials one way or another. Now, the, fertilizer, the primary fertilizer materials are water and air. As I was saying, water leads to that lush growth. Air leads to the constricted growth. And no fertilizer makes up for mismanagement of air and water. So, you know, water and air, really big components to be working with. Carbon to nitrogen, really important to be working with. And then start getting into some of the more finesse of handling some of these other materials. But it is very important to understand that you are guiding your crop's growth through this various uh, constriction or expansion through your agricultural practices. So now, as I said, we're obviously with heavy compost application, plenty of nitrogen, plenty of potassium, valley location. We are constantly seek to push towards constriction more through the fertilizer program. So we're using high carbon materials. We're applying uh, a lot of trap rock dust, which has got uh, a lot of silica in it. And we actively add sulfur into the compost pile, either through gypsum, calcium sulfate, or a little bit of elemental sulfur, maybe 10 to 20 pounds into 20 yards or so. And then on top of that, we add magnesium silicate in relatively large volumes. We probably add 500 pounds of talc to a 20 yard windrow. So magnesium silicate is obviously a double whammy, just like magnesium sulfate is. You know, it's, it's the uh, constrictive, constrictive mineral amendment. So when I say all these things now, and I told you all about that compost assembly and what minerals now we choose, you know, you have to take that into consideration in your location, in your fertility program of what we're doing versus what you want to be doing. So we're talking about organic matter soils are notorious for high phosphorus levels in a strong acid extract. And you're wondering how to get the phosphorus into the plant, if that's what you want. Yes, uh, getting calcium and phosphorus both in all magnesium, uh, all the slew of traces is uh, a primary challenge and, and the thing to really focus on. Uh, like I said, most vegetables, you test them, you're going to be very surprised at their nitrogen and potassium levels. So getting those materials in is the big challenge. The nitrogen and potassium move into a plant like nothing. They, they just, it's so easy to get enough nitrogen and potassium. So the trick is to, and, and they, these things work in opposition to each other. So if you're adding a lot of nitrogen, it becomes much more difficult to get enough magnesium or enough silica into the crop. So, uh, you know, they don't, it's not, you want both relatively elevated, but you really got to understand that they're interrelating completely. And so in order to move phosphorus into the crop, you really have got to watch your nitrogen inputs. And you need full biological activity, particularly fungus with phosphorus. And so the fungal, or I was talking about how unavailable phosphorus is. Apparently the big key to unlocking, because it seizes up into a stone-like material, calcium phosphate. And in order to re-release that stone-like material, 
It takes the fungal mycelium acids to break that bond down and release your calcium and phosphorus, and then the fungal organisms, and this is all theory, because you know, obviously I don't see this, but this is what agronomy has told me over the years. So they break the bonds and the fungal organisms are able to deliver that phosphorus in a chelated form back to the plant, full chelated being carbon containing uh, coated molecule, bring it back to the plant, down the fungal strand even, to the crop root where it's exchanged with the crop root for photosynthesis byproduct essentially as the photosynthesis sugars feed the fungal organisms. So that's the symbiotic relationship. So a classic under a tillage system is to reduce the fungal activity, have loads of locked up phosphorus and unavailable phosphorus getting into the, the plant roots and into the tissue analysis. Have we had increased phosphorus levels in our tissue analysis? Yes, the phosphorus levels have steadily come up. The nitrogen and potassium have come down. Magnesium, we've had some really nice calcium levels here and there. They're still not where I really want them in terms of you know, a tissue analysis, but we definitely have seen that movement, both you know, this down, this up. And uh, however, I'm not, I'm not profitable by tissue analysis and what I really see in the field is the results of the system. You know, obviously I track it using the, the analysis, but uh, you know, I'm really tracking it by the trials in the field and the, and the results of the crop growth in the field. But yes, it is rewarding to see that actually happen on uh, the tissue analysis as well. The way we primarily monitor that is to observe the crop in the field. And I was pointing to some of the lush factors, but what you want is a very steady growth right in the middle, right? So your, your internodal length should be appropriate. You know, it shouldn't be a long length. Your, your leaves, one of the biggest signs is the leaf thickness. Now, you don't want the leaf watery and able to rip. You want it, you want it the right color. You want it uh, the proper thickness. You don't want it too tough. If you push towards too constricted, the leaf actually gets tough. If it goes this way, it's too watery and it rips easily. So you're dialing in, you're looking at the leaf. You pull the roots out and look at the roots of the plants. Are they excessively branched and feeding on too much growth element? Are they not branched enough and shooting down for more element and more nutrient? So you look at the, you look at the whole overall growth. You, especially important is uh, when is the plant flowering? Did you delay flowering with your fertilizer choices? Is the flowering too early? Is the root vegetable compared to the leaf growth in proportion correctly? And so it's really a matter, yes, we do tissue analysis pretty frequently, soil, blah, 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 but really dialing in your observation skills of what the plant should look like compared to how you fertilized it and running trials next to each other to see what does what and how it's affecting you, very useful. But one of the really important and very useful techniques that we use is to observe plant pigmentation. And I showed you in the garlic here, but uh, which is a useful indicator crop. But crops like uh, red sale lettuce or a red salad bowl lettuce, a crop that can be either green or red is a very useful indicator plant or colored or not colored. So, you know, a red pepper is always gonna be red. And yes, there's gonna be vibrancy differences in the color of the orange carrot, but really good indicator plants are the ones that can go either way. And so uh, a lush uh, red salad bowl lettuce is actually green. And uh, properly grown, maybe pushing towards constricted, the red salad bowl lettuce can become so pigmented that it approaches uh, like the specialty reds like Merlot or firecracker or something like that. So, and that's true of red, sa red sails, other lettuces. Uh, the purple top turnip, uh, much less purple top under a high nit nitrogen load, much more purple coloration of a very vibrant nature under uh, a more balanced, appropriate uh, 
so pigmentation is very, very useful. You know, there's a number of other crops that do that, so you can just keep an eye for that one. And I'll just quickly describe what is going on there. And that is, as far as metabolically, what's been described to me is that the, so you have your photosynthesis product, which is a sugar, and the plant uses an enzymatic reaction to move that into a carbohydrate, and then another enzymatic reaction to move it into amino acid, another enzymatic reaction to move it into a protein, and so, and another enzymatic reactions to move it into more complex proteins, and it's this constant building procedure based on photosynthesis, right? And yes, there's other nutrients that get moved into the sugars, but essentially, you know, they're working, building sugars and making them more complex. And the enzyme to react each of those, it's a catalyst. The enzyme, which is the catalyst to react one material into the other, is uh, a trace mineral uh, chelated, trace mineral protein. So in order to have the proper enzymes to create a proper building, you have to have your trace mineral uh, availability proper because the plant, if it lacks the proper enzyme, it will substitute a different enzyme and all of a sudden your amino acid profile goes askew and you end up with a green lettuce instead of a red lettuce. And so you need all those things lined up in balance the way they are supposed to be, which is you want nature to be helping you to do that. And so pigments are way down the line of metabolic enzymatic reactions. So for a plant to be properly pigmenting, it takes proper metabolism. If proper metabolism is in place and you're getting a good load of pigment, it means that the, the plant is functioning well enough to also make compounds, which are the ones we seek in flavor and the ones that resist insect and disease assault. And so all those things go hand in hand. The pigmented, high flavor, high sugar crop is the one that does not get attacked by insects and diseases in the field. Let me just say, so in terms of fertilizer materials, so we showed you the pre-plant compost that went down, you know, amended against nitrogen and things like that in our case. And so that is our fertilizer input number one, followed by the mulch material, which is going to affect your carbon to nitrogen ratio and it's additional fertilizer material. So you had your compost pre-plant, you had your mulch. The next stage was we watered in with a fertigation system, which delivered a little seawater and a little bit of uh, fermented plant extracts. And uh, so that one sometimes will deliver a little boron with it, very, very small amount. But that is the you know, worm verma, verma casting water in that one. So that is the third fertilizer input, essentially. Then after that initial fertilizer input, if crops are looking for uh, more vigorous growth and sizing, the time to come in with nitrogen and calcium and things like the, the sizing elements, even the flowering elements really, is later. And so as the plant is growing, you come in and you side dress either, either with a liquid or a solid material in order to feed the crop more readily available nutrient sources. So you don't want to, if, if you had a cabbage crop, for instance, you don't want to come in and put down your nitrogen and calcium heavily before the crop is even in the ground. I mean, you should have a base of those materials available that's sufficient for early season growth. But if you're really trying to move things and push things in a certain direction and get sizing or whatever, you come in with those along the side of the crop as it's growing. So maybe a foot high or something maybe uh, four sets of leaves. And you, you side dress the materials and that gives you a fresh flush of growth, which is uh, largely, you know, what you're doing is you're amping up the soil microbiology along the side of, of the crop, which is delivering a fresh load of readily available nutrient into the crop. So side dressing, which I'm gonna come back to, 
side dressing, and I'm going to do the, these foliar preparations next. So side dressing is your next movement, and side dressing allows you, you know, I was describing moving to uh, flowering or growth. Side dressing is where you're going to use those mineral amendments to really move one way or the other. That's your chance to really move things. Foliar treatment, yes, you could cause flowering through a magnesium sulfate spray or something, foliar. But for us, we, the foliar spray is the fine tuning on top of all those other procedures. So we never are applying uh, mineral amendments, per se, in the foliar spray. The foliar spray is a, like a biological inoculant and very gentle uh, chelated materials to gently move the crop just that little bit more or a little other way, essentially to give us uh, disease and insect resistance to be sure that we are in a proper position for that to occur. So that is just a general overview of how we utilize those fertilizers. But I really liked the Korean natural farming foliar preparations because, as I said, they're very gentle, they're very organic in terms of carbon containing, and they are edible, which is I, I'm very hesitant to, tr to apply a foliar material that I am not comfortable eating. And a lot of foliars are like that. So let me run through some of these foliar materials, which, so obviously I discussed that we'll take the IMO and actively stir it. You know, put a couple quarts of IMO into a five gallon, well, it's probably like three or four gallons of water, stir it vigorously and strain it. That gives us a couple gallons probably and we will put that into maybe about 30 gallons of water total that's gonna feed out over to two acres, maybe 40 gallons of water. So, you know, we'll mix up, you know, a couple quarts go out over that area, maybe a little more, maybe two buckets, two, two buckets with two quarts to do both fields. So, you know, that's one of the, that's the biological inoculant going into the foliar spray. Then uh, other very interesting preparations are fermented plant juice, abbreviated FPJ, which is to take chopped plant material gathered in the early morning when the dew is still on it and mix it with brown sugar layered in a crock, weighted and covered, and ferment that for seven days. Strain and dilute one to 500 with water. And so what that is, and we use nettle, we use plantain, and uh, comfrey are three of the common ones, foliar. What that is, is you all heard about probably using nettle or comfrey as liquid fertilizer nutrient. This is a more refined version. You know, that stuff traditionally you ferment just in a vat of water, and it's very stinky, smelly. I would never eat it. This stuff, uh, is fermented with sugar and is tremendously good tasting and the sugar very, very effective at pulling vital nutrients. You know, it's a, what do you call it, hydroscopic. It pulls, sugar pulls liquids out of things. And so not only does it, it pulls the juice, the liquid, the cellular juices out of the plant matter, but it also is a relatively effective uh, preservative. So it has extracted the plant juices and keeps them relatively stable. And so it's approaching a kind of herbal medicine type of approach. And we use very specific herbs or plants that are for healing in our case. Yes, you make batches and store this material. Yeah, in our root cellar is where we store them. Probably they would store well into the refrigerator too. The fermented plant juice, generally they say store maybe six months or a year uh, is appropriate, but that is more created, uh, more season to season. This next one, oriental herb nutrient, 
is the use of specific uh, herbs, which this fermented plant juice is, you know, you decide what plants are appropriate and utilize. Oh, some of the other ones that we utilize under fermented plant juice are purslane for uh, giving a good coloration and pigmentation to the crop. Oh, I didn't really get to cover that well enough. Uh, and another preparation that we use is the use of carrot and beet uh, for that goes in the pre-plant fertilization to encourage uh, uh, that seedling termination. So we ferment, you know, little carrots, excess beets or whatever. We chop them up and we ferment them. And those liquid materials are incredibly vital, like a fermented carrot extract and a fermented beet extract. You know how they are in a, in a plant juice when you juice them? Uh, it is a very similar material for applying to the soil microbiology. So it is a very, very versatile recipe. And often the plants to heal your soil are growing right on your soil. Because of course nature, that's what nature is trying to do. It's trying to heal the soil. So the purslane growing right there is often, you know, so we have nettle growing everywhere and we have plantain growing everywhere. And obviously we brought in comfrey, but uh, it does naturalize as well. And uh, so often the plants that you need to utilize are right there on your field. So now getting on to some of these other recipes, the oriental herb nutrient, these are five specific herbs that they recommend you extract. And this material is storable for years. Uh, the oriental herb nutrient, I'm not going to read through how it's actually manufactured, but what it is, is it's basically a fermented, it goes into a fresh beer or sake, a live fermentation of these herbs that is then, so you ferment the herbs and then extract and strain out with an alcohol stabilization. So it's a combination of fermentation and alcohol extract, which is very useful, I think, herbal herbal medicine wise, uh, fermentation, very popular in Korea, obviously. So that gives, you know, those garlic ginger sprays in a very enhanced garlic ginger spray along with these other herbs. Apple cider vinegar, which they use rice vinegar. What would you be using these different herbs for? These are all the foliar sprays and these are for enhancing disease and insect resistance, potentially increase in pigmentation. These the, the herbal extracts that I got to there, I don't really consider them moving things towards flowering or constriction of flowering so much as just enhancing that little trace element and vitality that leads to proper metabolism. Apple cider vinegar is very useful for constricting the growth. It's an acid. Acids are the ones, you know, phosphoric acid, sulfuric acid. Acids are the constrictors. And so apple cider vinegar, we ferment on farm ourselves, uh, or they use rice vinegar, is a very useful material for getting things to the flowering side and hardening that leaf. If you come in with excessive vinegar spray, you will see a lot of leaf hardening, which can be really useful if you're faced with downy mildew in lettuces or other fungal diseases, and you really need to push towards hardening. So vinegar at those dilution rates is very useful and should, you should definitely keep your eye on it. And now I'm gonna talk about the last two here, which are vinegar extracts of eggshells or roasted charred bones. So when you take eggshells and you roast them and grind them and then add vinegar to the eggshell, it reacts, you know, obviously bubbles and you know, the acid alkaline, but what the end product is, is you have created things like calcium acetate, which is a calcium wrapped in a, a, a organic compound. So you have, you have made a readily available liquid calcium fertilizer for foliar application, calcium being very difficult, as I said, to get into the plant. And the bone is calcium phosphate. So it's gonna get you both calcium and phosphorus in a small dose into, in an in a organic compound, 
readily available for your plant growth. So those are very useful foliar materials. And a couple others, which I'll just talk about quickly, is we do ferment our own fish. So we take fish waste, mix one by one with brown sugar, layered in a crock with the IMO inoculant in it. And yes, it can smell bad. I've, I've seen batches come out and smell like fish sauce and not too bad at all. However, the quality of homemade fish fertilizer actively fermented and still live compared to commercially purchased acid stabilized fish fertilizer that's purchased on the market is the worlds apart. Uh, so the fish fertilizer, you know, has got the IMO in it itself. It's not been sterilized with acids. It's not been pasteurized. And uh, it's uh, just a tremendous improvement over commercial fertilizers. And that's true of calcium acetate, you know. Calcium acetate, yes, there's calcium foliars and sprays out there. But this it is almost free to create your own superior uh, fertilizer materials out of eggshells and vinegar. And uh, now I would not spray the fish onto a foliar treatment. That is for side dress liquids or we use it in the potting soil is where we, we don't actually hardly ever apply nitrogen to the field, but we do need it in the potting soil. And it's a very nice material. And then the last one is simple, the use of milk, which is we do use just regular raw milk sometimes, uh, in, especially in the potting soil formula, but uh, they simply use raw milk whey and so we, we often get excessive milk from some of the local dairy pr producers and we simply uh, strain out the solids and leave the way we feed the solids to the chickens. And then we have a whey uh, ferment that we can use for foliar application. So thank you for being such a great audience and being so interested. <laughs> <laughs>